thanks for coming, all few of you. And uh, we don't mind, we'll talk to anybody that wants to hear about Propio, okay? So um, I'll just introduce uh, myself. I'm Tom Hawkins. Forasource is my company. Uh, Mark Oda from Carapia Inc. And Tom, I help you with your last name, Tom? Uh, Skelton. Skelton, excuse me. Uh, we only met last week from Ecotech. So um, Mark is the gentleman that has introduced Carapia to the United States. And uh, we work, Tom's company, Ecotech, or the company he's with, and my company work with Mark as uh, sales rep and technical support for Carapia. So we've got uh, a presentation that's pretty much geared to these pictures. Might be good if we could turn the lights down, if somebody can do that, that'd be great. And we're gonna keep this entertaining by rotating so that you don't have to hear any one of us speak for more than about five or six slides, hopefully. So uh, hopefully you'll find that um, format okay. And uh, I'm starting. So uh, this is what we're just hoping to cover. In case you have to leave early, you'll know what you missed. But uh, just defining what Carapia is and how it differs from the, the native species. Uh, uh, I'm, not I'm not uncomfortable with them standing. I just want them to be comfortable. Uh, how, how it differs from the species, the benefits of Carapia, you know, especially compared to the species and landscape applications. Installation techniques, a couple challenges that we've found, and uh, maintenance, which is pretty simple. Uh, so Carapia is a selection of Lipia notiflora, or also known as Phyla notiflora. Uh, it has, it's in the Verbena family, so it has a, a Verbeniaceae a family member, perennial ground cover, and it's native to um, both of the Americas, but also uh, native or naturalized in other parts of the world, um, including Japan. Um, it, it is found in our California native plant manual uh, under Lipia notiflora, and um, that's the native species. Uh, Carapia differs uh, from the native Lipia or Phyla in that it is sterile, and it's the first introduced Carapia to be sterile. Oh, sorry, first introduced Lipia. And uh, the name Carapia comes from a combination of the breeder and Lipia. So if you're wondering why is this such a difficult name to pronounce, just think of the word tilapia and say Carapia. <laughs> um, it, it's sterile uh, and it doesn't produce seed, but it still uh, produces some nectar. So it's, attracting, uh, it's attractive to bees and uh, butterflies and other pollinators. Um, so you can see in the photos they're showing the seed count in one flower head of Lipia, which is what makes it considered to be invasive, whereas there's no seed coming from Carapia. Carapia uh, is also uh, much less sensitive to cold, so you can see the Carapia on the right and then what it would look like in the winter uh, as compared with Lipia. So it's main, re remaining evergreen uh, we're saying down to 20 or so in California until we learn more. Um, Mark has heard or seen uh, plantings in Japan that have gone down to about 13. And then Carapia has a, a much faster uh, fill-in rate than Lipia. Um, another thing I've observed in uh, looking at some Lipia plantings is they become quite patchy. So you see a lot of bare open spaces eventually, and that's not the case with Carapia. It maintains solid coverage quite easily. So, um, Mark, you've been working with Carapia in Japan for about seven or eight years, is that right? Uh, nine years. Nine years. And uh, Mark came uh, to California with this plant maybe three uh, years, four years, four years ago. I should let him have the slide, but he's got the next one. So, <laughs> Uh, or the one after this. So Mark, I think very cleverly, though there was a lot of research that had been done in Japan on Carapia, he came and had many of these studies repeated here by uh, UC Riverside, uh, by the Dry Institute, the Desert Research Institute, and more recently at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. 
Um, so he's had uh, evaluations done by the Center for Urban Horticulture and taking a look at these topics at the top. So drought research, non-invasive species research, uh, erosion control, and weed control. So basically repeating a lot of what already had been known in Japan, but being able to let people know that this work has been done here as well. So with that note, Mark. <coughs> So, um, uh, the first test has been conducted by using Riverside for the uh, deficit delegation uh, trial, where we tested with the condition 40% of ETO, which is pretty deficit mitigation situation. We uh, compared crop up with uh, all major turf uh, grasses, with uh, cold season grasses and warm season grasses too. And crop up performed um, uh, one of the best performance uh, under this uh, deficit mitigation conditions. In terms of uh, maintaining the solid green color throughout the deficit period from starting from May to uh, September, Grapia was the only one who was maintaining the green colors. Other warm season grasses has has um, uh, suffered from uh, severe damage of the shortage of water. And uh, right. we have tested a uh, comparison that's a delegation comparison test between Bermuda grass and Crapia, tested by Desert Research Institute of Nevada State. Um, the, do you have a point? Yeah. This is for me. Um, this uh, drawing, the blue line is a Bermuda grass, and the red line is a Crapia. Uh, the Vertical line is a commemorative water usage per liter, and uh, those are the days. So basically, uh, the differences between Bermuda grass and the Crapia is uh, about 40% uh, less compared to Bermuda grass. So uh, even compared with the warm season grasses, Crapia uses more rest, uh, less water. Save about 50 to 60 percent of water compared to the Okay. Uh, here's a close up photo of the same uh, deficit delegation study by Music Riverside on Draft Park. So in, uh, in the center is a graph here. Uh, this is Zoe Shear. St. Augustine, Cicho Pasquala, and Bermuda grass all brown up. Okay. Uh, we tested with uh, UC Davis, uh, which was uh, performed in uh, 2014. Um, with a more deficit delegation, extreme deficit delegation situation, which includes 20% uh, of the ETO, uh, and we performed excellent uh, results. This picture has been taken after 53 days, no irrigation at all in summer in Davis in 2014. So uh, this 50, uh, it said 58 days, but it's currently Three, three days. Um, but this has been done by the different, uh, well, the drip mitigation. So in case you allow to use a drip mitigation, you can save more water than overhead or sprinkler uh, mitigation. This shows uh, Grapia's excellent erosion control facility. Uh, 
the picture is taken after cutting out as a saw and wash out all those soils. So this doesn't contain any soils. It, it's combined of uh, storum and uh, the, the roots only. So it creates a dense mud and it can create a, a canopy on top of the topsoil. So uh, due to those uh, two tensions, it performed perfectly as a erosion control uh, cover plants. Uh, this shows the extreme condition of uh, uh, use for the slope for the erosion control purposes. We planted it with plaque with about uh, 18 inches and uh, this is completed after two or three months uh, without irrigation. But this always is taken into hand so we have a lot of natural, uh, <coughs> natural rainfall and in the season so we didn't have any uh, irrigation facility. But in, in California we need to have a uh, irrigation facility. But it perfectly holds the soil even <coughs> though it, it has a very steep slope. Right. Um, oh, this is Tom. Sorry, you've heard enough from Mark. Got to oh, hey. mix it up here. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you guys some of the uh, unique features about Carapia. Here what we're trying to depict is some of the uh, some drastic soil conditions that you may face out there in the field. You notice here we have a, a range uh, of EC measurements. Um, you can see here between the range, even where it starts at, at an EC of two, is a very trouble of problematic soil that's difficult to establish or grow most plant material. And you can see as we approach an EC of seven, which is uh, not not very common, but can can occur. Um, you can still see that carapia is thriving um, despite those those poor soil conditions. That's one of the things we want to highlight. Uh, carapia can withstand um, very problematic soils, so that can be a wide range of salinity issues um, or uh, pH that may not be that sustainable for plant growth. And reclaimed water. Oh, uh, exactly. Reclaimed water, um, the prevalence of reclaimed water and high salts um, is often a concern with drip irrigation and, and uh, reclaimed water. Um, here, you know, we want to highlight the, the dense habit of carapia once it establishes because it's spreading by above ground stolons or above, above ground root stems. Uh, once it finally roots in, it takes off rapidly. Um, because of that dense habit, it's not going to allow weeds to um, make their way in to germinate and uh, populate in areas of uh, low density. So that's another, another unique feature of this ground cover um, because of its, its dense growth habit. Another uh, morphological feature is its uh, cold tolerance. There's been some uh, studies done at both UC Davis and UC uh, Riverside. Um, it does have uh, a unique feature to resist uh, freezing temperatures or temperatures below freezing, whereas more, most warm season grasses, they're, they're going to go dormant. You'll see them in the winter. They appear brown. Um, it takes a significant low temperature to, um, to bring a, a, out a browning in Carapia, and we're talking like below 18 degrees which down here in Southern California doesn't really occur too much unless you're in higher elevation. So here we, we have a picture that depicts uh, Carapia in the parkway adjacent to a warm season grass during the winter. You can see the warm season grass has gone dormant or went into its dormancy because of the cold temperature. And you can see that the Carapia has maintained that evergreen appearance. Yes, do you have a question? I do. Um how does it fare with different types of water um, applications, whether it would do better with spray above ground, or can it handle subterranean? It, it, it will do well in both. Okay. Um, we have some slides that will we'll kind okay, of sorry, show you some, some of the uh, 
uh, performance in different uh, irrigation applications, but yes, you can do both. And what I would recommend is when we get to uh, establishing, mm -hmm. uh, the initial establishment, um, it does need a little bit more water than some of these studies are showing, okay. um, just because yes, of the sorry. nature of its uh, how it spreads. You know, once it gets those roots in, um, it's remarkable um, in its reduction of water use. Okay. But uh, overhead, yes. Drip, yes. Subterranean, yes. Thanks, Tom. Okay, a little bit on applications. Uh, one of the one of the uses of interest now is as a lawn replacement or a lawn alternative, again, because of the water saving uh, features of Karapia. And um, in spite of um, a lot of our, our water supply issues, there's still an interest by many to have that green look, maybe a reduced lawn <coughs> size, not in the case of this photo, certainly, but you know something that will present that appearance. And so we wanted to show you some uh, slides that show that Karapia can look like a lawn. And uh, it can be mowed or it can be left unmowed. Uh, but in this case, in this picture, it's been mowed. And this is a picture of, uh, from Japan. Uh, but uh, we're starting to see some photos uh, of projects that look kind of like this here. Um, again, uh, residential uh, landscapes in Japan. And now starting with some landscapes here. So this is a, a lawn replacement in San Diego. and. Uh, basically took out the old lawn and put in Karapia. Saved, uh, she says, about 75% 70, on her water bill right now, is what she's thinking. Um, this is a project in Hidden Hills in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, Santa Monica planning. You notice uh, in these pictures the flowers, we're gonna talk about the flowers. If you don't like them, they can be easily mowed and removed but Karapia uh, will flower naturally from about mid-April, 1st of May through the end of October, or beginning of October. Uh, another planting in Thousand Oaks. This was, what, Mark, I think you said this was your first Karapia planting with the Landscape Architects uh, home in uh, Thousand Oaks, so showing that it takes the heat quite well. This picture was taken in August of 2014, so right in the heat of summer in Thousand Oaks. Huh? Um, here's a couple other residential sites. Um, you can see one here on the left in between some of the, the perennials. They use the Karapia as a ground cover. Um, and you notice here on the picture on the right, I had first-hand experience with this one. This is uh, the landscape that Ecotech installed in Glendora. Um, it was kind of a, a, a site that really didn't get the attention that it needed. Um, and the only attention it got was media attention because they had let their landscape die um, according to the governor's calling to reduce their water use. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but because it had gotten that attention, we felt like we should uh, reach out and introduce some, um, some um, solutions for drought tolerant landscaping. And this was ideal. We, we got to install Karapia. This is our first installation and uh, it went very well. What about the sign, Tom? Can you comment on that? Oh, sign? <laughs> the, the sign was kind of a, a way to empower the community. Uh, we wanted to encourage and commend um, some of the, the residents and our clients that they were taking an active role in water conservation. We started this campaign called Drought Hero, um, to, just to, to, to empower the residents. You know, hey, look, we're, we're doing something about the drought. Um, you know, take a look, here's, here's a demonstration. Ask us questions, please. Um, find a way to participate. But uh, yeah, so we, we try to implement a, a campaign, Drought Hero, and invite the, the testimonials from, from the clients that we, uh, we serve. Uh, this is another project uh, in El Cajon. Um, you can see here is a very significant slope. Um, th another contractor installed this. We didn't uh, get to install this ourselves, but uh, you can see quite successful. Um, quite a big expanse on that hillside, but um, you know, as as we had mentioned about the uh, the dense rooting, um, it's going to really help with that erosion control and uh, sustain that slope. Uh, another successful installation there. Uh, another one in Laguna Hills. Again, we have another slope uh, condition. 
You can see where the crappie was used on uh, the bank of the slope, and it's got kind of that nice cascading effect going over the, uh, the wall there. But uh, we do want to highlight, you know, this is a good solution for, for slopes and erosion control. And it has uh, various uses, you know. Um, some of the public spaces, uh, you can see here in the, these pictures what they're depicting. Um, parkways, um, some of your utility areas. Um, it has a wide range of applications. So and keep that in mind. Uh, anywhere you can picture a ground cover. Uh, you can see here the water treatment plant uh, in the top left corner. Uh, they're using that for uh, bioremediation um, to help clean the water. Uh, also, if you look in the uh, bottom right corner, uh, you have a crappie planted alongside that river bank. Uh, any of that runoff that's going to make it into, uh, into that waterway, the crappie will help with uh, remediation. So it's, it's a good application for bioswales, water catchment, um, scenarios like that. It has a very good application. Mark? Thanks. This is a planting at the city of Novato. Comparison made between Daimonia and Clavia. Uh, they are both planted at the same day. And uh, you, you can see that how uh, fast the Clavia is uh, filled out the area, whereas the Daimonia is still in a small size, not covering at all. So, uh, this landscape, con this is, has been done, done by the landscape contractor, but the city likes the result of it, and uh, they will they introduce some more areas. Um, this is the picture of uh, a typical health street, but uh, wasting a lot of water. Uh, this can be totally replaced with crab. Crab that will much. Uh, save much of the water. Um, parkway and medium planting. This is a picture in uh, Venice in the Los Angeles area. And uh, these are um, irrigated by the drip irrigation you don't see, but it is it's a, a drip irrigation, but uh, using only a little of shows about the chronological uh, growing uh, speed of uh, crab uh, from May planting until July almost covering all. It has filled out the total area by end of August. So it took about uh, three months. The soil was very poor. It was uh, heavy gray soil. It's a lucky soil. Even with that condition, I, I worry that uh, I worry that if uh, it works or not, but it's completely works well. And, and uh, usage for parks and recreation, uh, as I repeatedly mentioned, uh, this crab yeah, is not good for the athletic purposes, but it will accept light to. Uh, 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 media crappy. Uh, so another area that we've been working in is uh, schools and university campuses again for uh, reducing water use. Uh, this is a picture uh, in the background of a crappy lawn uh, in front of the president's home at Scripps College with turf in front. Um, so you might say, well, the crop is a little bit lighter green in color, but it's a new planting too and hasn't had any fertilizer. So um, it probably eventually could match the lawn in color if it was fed. Same lawn, just a different view. Um, this uh, planting was uh, installed in June and filled in in about nine or ten weeks, uh, taking advantage of the heat. They, and they mowed this. This has been mowed. This is a planning that uh, Mark arranged for at uh, USC uh, Medical Center at uh, uh, Keck Medical Center in Los Angeles um, in a memorial garden there, um, showing uh, 
you know, water saving plants like Karapia. And this is an entryway to Miramar College that we were involved with, uh, where both sides of the drive were planted with Karapia. Uh, this was done in uh, summer, uh, getting ready for the school year. And um, you know, as you can see here, it's, this photo was taken a few weeks ago, so it was filled in again pretty much within the confines of the summer. And uh, they still had not taken the fencing down, but uh, it, it looks like it would be ready to do so now with that kind of coverage. Uh, another one we did was at Pepperdine University. Uh, the photo on the upper left was uh, what they had. It was acacia redolent and some, uh, some other uh, types of, uh, like myoporum and some plants like that. And uh, they weren't happy with the look. And so they've replaced that, and in this lower section of the bottom photo, this is all done with Parabia. Um. So I want to share with you guys some of the um, observations we've learned um, planting Carabia, and then after it's established, some of the uh, maintenance, which is very minimal. Um, one of the things that is very important is the planting height. For Carabia, because of the way that it spreads um, by above ground stolen, um, if you bury it too deeply, it's it's gonna it's not gonna be able to reach out, get the light, and uh, continue its growth. So you can see here we have a, a line kind of demarking the the planting height. Now that gap in between there is about a quarter inch um, of, of soil on top of the plug, and then when you pack the plug in, you know, of course you're gonna tamp it. And when you finish, lightly press with the palm of your hand to set it in, make some contact with those stolons so that they can root into the soil. Um, we had some different trials with trying to um, submerge the plant under a, a, a larger portion of soil or a deeper portion of soil and was not as uh, successful. Uh, so you can see here, that's about the appearance that you want to see from the plug when you plant it at the initial planting. Um, okay, soil preparation. Uh, the soil, how, how compacted it is, um, if it's very compacted, it's gonna be difficult for those stolons to root into the soil. What we do recommend is maybe some light conditioning. Uh, if you use some soil amendments that contain humic or fulvic acids to help break up some of that clay, how tight it is. So about two, four inches deep of breaking. Yeah, I mean a light rototill would be nice. If you can get a rototill in and, and rototill in some maybe some compost and or, uh, maybe like a, a product that has some of those uh, organic acids that help uh, condition the soil, you'll see a better establishment. Um, what we did find that helps too um, is covering it lightly with like a seed topper um, or like a compost, a very light, fine material. Something, you don't want to get into like your coarse bark. You get into something that's like bigger than an inch, three quarters of an inch, it, it's, it's too big. We, we had some trials, we're trying to put some mulch on top. It just, it takes much longer for the carapia to finally establish because it's trying to grow out of the mulch and then root back down through those coarse, that coarse texture. Um, you can see here is a, um, a planting sequence where we have an old uh, front lawn, traditional grass, uh, remove the grass, planted carapia on center, 18 inch on center, and then you can see as it starts to fill in to replace where the lawn had thrived. Um, we want to show you some of the establishment dates here. This was like, again, this was the site in Hidden Hills. Uh, notice this was right, right before the uh, onset of summer. Temperatures are, are high down here in Southern California. Despite the heat, uh, it, established, it established in about two months. Uh, very rapid establishment for ground cover. Um, I don't know if you guys had previous experience trying to install ground covers, especially in summer. It's very challenging because they have a very limited root system, being that they're in a plug or that you're pulling them from flats, uh, it's a challenge to keep the, that irrigated and thriving so that it establishes. Uh, again, here's another uh, site, uh, Laguna Hills. This one was planted uh, in about mid-autumn. Mid 
And then you can see by about by February, despite you know uh, soil temperatures dropping, usually things start to uh, slow down, go dormant because temperatures uh, went below 45 degrees in the soil. Um, regardless, we still had a pretty good establishment in the middle of winter, which is again another challenge. So here's the, the same site, Laguna Hills. Uh, by May, uh, another three months after that, uh, from February, you, you see you got full coverage. Um, it, it's thriving, it's, it's doing its thing. And that's what we expect to see with Caravia. Uh, so irrigation, we had uh, some questions about irrigation applications. Um, I've had first-hand first experience using overhead application. Um, what I would recommend is maybe uh, if you're going to use overhead, use like a rotating stream nozzle just to help with the soil to be able to absorb the, uh, the, the rate of water that's being applied. Uh, however, it is a good application. You can use overhead. I've had experience with drip. It is easy to install with drip. I would keep in mind your soil type because it's going to affect your row spacing and also the, uh, the flow rate for your the gallons per hour. Um, so if you know your soil, and uh, you know your product, you install your irrigation according to the product specifications, you're going to have success with irrigation. I've done both on surface and subsurface. Um, I would recommend if you're going to encourage your client to mow, perhaps put that irrigation subsurface. Um, you can aerate with Carapia. If you're going to aerate, make sure that irrigation is below those aerating tines so you don't puncture your irrigation lines. Um, one thing I would also recommend too in the first four weeks of establishment, you might need a little bit more oversight. Um, it will need a little bit more water than when it fully establishes. Just until those stolons can root in, then you can back off and uh, rely on very minimal irrigation. What about bubblers? Bubblers, I think you would use a significant amount of bubblers. Um, the amount of bubblers that you would need to create an even distribution. So you couldn't just do one? That's uh, the I don't think so. I, I think you would have some, some trials. Okay. And you would be uh, a little disappointed with its uh, rate of establishment. Okay. Um, you know, so the uniformity is key. It, you know, your row spacing for drip irrigation um, is crucial. You know, if you got a sandy soil and you're at 22 inches or 20 inches, you need to bring it tighter. The, the, the drip is just going to go right through that uh, through the sand. If you have clay soil or more clay soil, then yeah, 18 to 20 inches is appropriate uh, because clay, the way water behaves in clay, um, the, the wider row spacing is more appropriate. So yeah, I would encourage head-to-head -head coverage if you're using overhead. Uh, MP rotators work great. Thanks, Tom. Uh -huh. So uh, just a few pictures of some things that we've learned about uh, some of these plantings that we've done. And this was one in Newport Beach where they had, again, a uh, kind of an old worn out landscape with mostly myoporum. And they had existing uh, ir uh, drip irrigation on the soil surface. And they're hoping to do this low budget. And uh, they, uh, they had a pretty crummy soil, but they were asking if they could, you know, try it without soil prep. We've done a few plantings with no soil prep and found that they work, but they take longer, of course, to fill in. So uh, whenever there's uh, a chance to recommend some kind of modest prep, we would do so. But this one uh, was, a, was an interesting one, too, because they had bark there already, and they wanted to keep the bark for weed suppression. And uh, Tom mentioned briefly about the mulching idea. And this is one of the ones that we've uh, shared with each other where we've learned that this kind of mulch is not a good idea. And it's mainly just because of the coarse nature of the bark. Um, one of the early plantings that, uh, that, that was done was at the UC South Coast Research Station in Irvine. And they also used a bark like this. And uh, it, it didn't really deter the, the project there, but it was a very small project and I think that it was closely managed. But on this project, a little bit greater scale, uh, this is what we were seeing. So we, we saw a very, uh, the, the upper 
lack of establishment is a little bit due to some irrigation issues they had with these old drip lines where they thought they were working and they weren't. So they lost some plugs and had to come back in and replant after fixing the irrigation. But you can see down below, you know, they're getting more fill in, but it's not very uniform fill in. And this was taking a long time. I thought that, you know, our bare ground plantings filled in much faster than this one was. And so what we're seeing was we're getting these really, really long stolons. And I could uh, take these back and maybe, you know, these were, uh, you know, one and a half, two feet sometimes. And they were not rooting down. And so we think that the bark, in this case they had more than two inches of bark, was serving more as a barrier because the roots couldn't find their way into true soil. And uh, the last time I was there I encountered this kind of look and I hadn't seen this before. And so uh, I emailed this photo promptly to Mark and he said that he had seen this once before and that he thinks that uh, it was the same situation where the uh, stolons will run and you'll get quite a bit of vegetative growth, but they're not able to root down. And so uh, the mother plug tends to uh, react negatively and starts to fatten up or get woody as a result of more water stress, you know, from not having all that growth, um, being able to, to, you know, experience rooting. So we like mulching, but as Tom was saying, we'd rather see a fine mulch. And uh, you know, not maybe a great depth, but uh, one inch maximum, two inches, something like a, a lawn topper or a, a seed topper, as he was saying, like in this photo. And uh, this one's very happy. Also wanted to point out that in some situations, we've seen rabbits as a problem, and in others, we haven't. We don't think that deer are a problem at all with Carapia. We had a pretty good test of that at Pepperdine University where they have deer come down right onto the middle of campus. And we didn't see any damage. But uh, rabbits, we have seen some issues. So um, it can be a good idea to, to fence it for just the first several weeks for establishment to make sure the plant gets rooted in. And then in the case of like this Miramar planting, the fencing was more just to keep people off of it until it was established. So again, for a eight or 10 week period. Um, Crapia will flower, I mentioned, from uh, about uh, mid-April to 1st of October. And the flowers are attractive to bees and butterflies. Um, some people are concerned about bees because of bee allergies um, or small children. So uh, an easy way to, uh, to deal with this is if you, if you do not want the bees would be to mow the crapia. And uh, this is a lawn in San Clemente. On the left side, uh, what it looked like before mowing, plenty of flowers. This photo was taken in July. And then uh, the right photo, you know, shortly thereafter, where it looks more like a lawn without all the white blooms. How often do you need to mow? Uh, Mark's guideline was every three weeks. And we've heard at Scripps College that that, that is right on. And this is a homeowner that uh, I've I know, and she says that uh, it's the same for them. They mow every three or four weeks, keep the bees away. Um, they're happy with the bees, but they have uh, a dog, and then they have next door neighbor with small children that come over, so they, they're mowing for that those reasons. Mark? We're in the home stretch here. May occur even though gravity is established or in, in between um, in, in the establishment period. So the, we've been working on this per, uh, selective herbicide study for gravia for pre-emergent and post-emergent. Gravia is known as a broadleaf, but uh, some of the broadleaf type uh, herbicide can be used, and uh, gravia has some tolerance on it. So. Um, the cow poly, San Luis Obispo, and the UC Riverside, as well as the University of Arizona, are working on a crack herbicide, selective herbicide trial study. And we'll, the result will come out um, so very soon, within, uh, within, within a couple of weeks. So um, we can notify to all those customers who need those information. Also, uh, may 
okra. But even we have a good selective herbicide for this too. In our defense, uh, Tom had brought it up, and I was thinking the same thing. We want to point out that the nut sedge we've seen on some golf course trials, and in this case at Miramar College, it was there. You know, it didn't come with the crop yet. It was just the condition that they had. And he told me, the grounds manager there, that they've been battling nut sedge. We have another uh, planting uh, out at uh, Sunnylands Golf Course in the desert, and they have the same issue. And they have a lot of nut sedge on the golf course. So um, it, it uh, if it's there, it can be a problem, but it's not that nutsedge will go find crop. That this was already there in the soil. Very, very common in, in one application. It's, it's still too early to, to mention about the name of the crop herbicide, but uh, so, uh, sedge harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, after crop is established, then crop wouldn't be a uh, severe effect. It's not damaged. Maybe it won't damage the crop yet, yeah. but we'll control it in some channel. Yeah. Okay, Mark. So the, a lot of uh, home owners and uh, commercial users apply for the water rebate program for turf removal replacement with crop yet. and uh, uh, DW. MWB, yeah, Metropolitan uh, Water District, uh, gave us a, a, not up to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the credit, but uh, they mentioned that Krapia can be used for this program. So a lot of application has been submitted and successfully gone through. So uh, if a uh, customer wants to use a river program, please do recommend. And we, I, I've had a first-hand experience, it, it does improve, um, yeah. yeah, you'll get the rebate. And uh, as you can see, crab is uh, uh, friendly to, not only for bees, but for other animals like butterflies and cats and dogs. And uh, it accepts some of the urine, it will, it will change to yellowish, but it will recover soon because of the salinity. These are the new varieties coming for the future. Oh, now we have only white color for flower variety, but we are bringing in pink flower variety. And uh, cold resistant variety has, uh, is, has another function, which is a disease resistance. Um, the, we currently, our, uh, we currently recommend our uh, current variety for the allied uh, uh, circumstances and the environment uses only because when it came to high humidity it might have a disease issue but we don't, we don't see any issues of uh, disease under allied condition like in California but if we try to expand the market from California to eastern regions, we might foresee a uh, high humidity with the disease issue. So we are bringing in this cold resistance as well as a disease resistance uh, variety. We have a fight for the uh, identification, plant identification already, uh, waiting, for, waiting to be approved. And the row of uh, bottom is a row flowering variety. I wouldn't say no flower, but uh, you can see clearly uh, flower, uh, no flowers. And that's coming? Yeah, that's, that's gonna be coming uh, not, not very soon, but um, probably in a couple of years' time we're bringing it. So this is just a summary slide of um, what we talked about with uh, <coughs> with Crapia, if anybody was interested in the pH, you know, it takes a wide range of pHs. Uh, 
shade down to about three hours of sunlight, so pretty good in, uh, in shade situations. And uh, there's the USDA hardiness zone uh, equivalent to that 20 Fahrenheit figure, if that's of interest. <clears throat> so we're uh, now finished, and we have a full almost 40 minutes for you to ask questions. And if you don't ask them in that, we're going to take that time and ask you guys questions. It'll be more like a quiz. No, uh, but were there any more, any questions? Yes? I have some more. Okay. Um, we talked about, uh, I just was wondering, you saw the application on slopes. What, how does it deal with in fire areas? Um, it being a succulent, you would think it would be um, more water holding and therefore have uh, you know, uh, that's no. issues. I have to look at that. You know, I, yeah, but I'm thinking there's there's three zones I think for fire control that right. the fire department mm -hmm. puts out, and I think within those zones they typify what plants and, and forms of plants too um, are permitted mm -hmm. in, in those zones. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I think it's class one, two, three, or A, B, C. I forget, and I, I think I'm confused because I think it's different sometimes by county. But um, I've been told by a couple landscape architects in San Diego that they think that it would get a very favorable rating for that because of the succulent nature of the plant, like you mentioned. Uh, it but we have haven't. Oily or anything like no, that, like no. Or something yeah, like that. yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, it's. It's pretty tough to to not have it remain evergreen even when you cut the irrigation. You know, it's, it stays pretty fleshy for quite a long time. That's just the nature. So it is evergreen throughout the year in most of California. Yeah, it's like I think Tom mentioned, it's a little bit elevation related. So if it gets you know below that 20 Fahrenheit, maybe 18 mm -hmm. Fahrenheit, it will go off color, but it would not necessarily be you know a, a fuel plant at that point um, unless it was dry like that all the time. Um, the other question I had was in regards to the Mawa. We, um, anybody who's listened to what's going on with the um, restrictions for irrigation for landscape, know that they're going to cut it back severely and even to the point. So, you know, how, if I were to design it and use it in, and I can think of two projects I'd like to use this in, um, how would you rate the Mawa? Where would it be in terms of the classification? Yes. We got cool season grass as the 1.0. I believe it's at 0.3. Yeah, that would be my guess. I'm not, I'm not sure, but it sounds right. Because I, I spoke with uh, John from West Coast Turf, and they were doing some studies about that. And he had some he had some um, positive um, testimony to or feedback um, growing it in comparison to some of the warm season grasses that they produce at, at West Coast Turf. And he said that he did see um, the the water use was drastically um, different, less than the warm season grasses. And warm season grasses are typically, I think, of 0.4 to 0.6. Okay. All right. Good. Good. I'd say safe to say. I'm good. from Bakersfield, and we do oh. Bermuda everywhere. So, you, you know, you laugh at the person who's successful, but there are. Yeah. And so that's where I'm trying to, how, if this is really going to make it worth my while not using Bermuda, uh, knowing that typically people in the winter time in the past, and probably in the future would actually oversee the dry and use more water. Yeah. So. That uh, chart that Mark had showed, uh, the graph rather, with Bermuda was a good, you know, a good example of Carapia compared to Bermuda, where it was about a 40% difference mm -hmm. in less water. And how do you determine that? Okay, you know, the average person, you know, how can you make sure as a designer to let the maintenance people know? Okay, you don't need to leave it on 10 minutes at a time anymore. I mean, now most of uh, California is on even a two-day or three-day kind of period, but that's not necessarily, the counties don't time it in which you say you only have right. a certain amount of time. Okay, or scared. if you're dealing with um, a public agency, you have a water in particular. Um, I, I would use the 0 0.3 factor okay. in scheduling. I think that's, I think that's safe. Um, it's a challenging question. Beyond establishment time, I think that's a, that's a good guideline. And I, I think that um, 
Because so you're saying it is as a guideline for establishment, and then it can actually go lower to the 0.25 or 0.2. Well, no, I'm saying I think that in the beginning, an establishment, you know, it, it, depending, you're in Bakersfield, so right. you know, we might be watering once to twice a week on the coast here, and you may need to be watering two times or more. And if you, if technically you're not allowed to water two times or more, then what I, what we're recommending is that you do a. Well, that's only if you don't see. Well, but there's a way around that is what I wanted to say yeah, too, yeah. and that would be like a, a, we use a product called Ziva, it's a cornstarch polymer, and it's a dip. And it's a really good insurance policy for areas like on slopes where you maybe have poor, you know, irrigation uh, penetration, mm -hmm. but also um, in areas where you might be on a two day a week watering, and uh, we found that that works well. Uh, in terms of dipping it before and after yeah. putting the soil mm -hmm. and dealing with that mulch. Mm -hmm. And that's a product that we can provide with plugs when we shut. You know, if you determine to do the amount of inches that you need to replace per month, mm -hmm. um, uh, If you know the application rate of your irrigation system mm -hmm. and you know the inches that you need to replace, um, you can dial in your irrigation. Say you only have the two days a week, right? Mm -hmm. And you know uh, you got to replace five inches in the summer mm -hmm. or six inches, probably for bakers too. That's what we get all you know. <laughs> right, right. Um, say, well, on the two watering events that you have, mm -hmm. um, you can do your cycle and soak mm -hmm. to, to make up those, those inches or make up that difference. Okay, that um, makes sense. I see um, subterranean being a really good application, and we tend to use the easy flow fertilizer, so then it gets out as well, so you don't have to, That's you know, good. see that. Um, and even the city of Vegas really fun with that as well. So. Well, you're ahead of the curve. <laughs> Most cities will also give you an exemption if you're installing something new. If you're going to show when you go to the city and you say, I'm going to pull this out to put something in like right. Rapia, mm -hmm. you're going to get an exemption and you're going to be able an establishment period. And this stuff establishes really fast compared to most things. So it's an easy sell to the city and you know what you want And I was going to mention a problem that I've seen and that is uh, that people are so used to watering lawns, you know, five days a week or more that once they even have their crappie established, they're still overwatering it. You know, they could be saving more water than they want, than they, than they are. And I've seen that on uh, institutional type of plantings as well as residential. So it's it's not just the homeowner that's guilty of that. No, and I think that's probably the biggest issue is getting back to the maintenance people because they're stuck on 10 minutes mm -hmm. of time and not realize they don't have to necessarily take that, especially when they can't see it. Yeah. Um, and because they're, the in the past, they've be been, no safe. They've been safe by overwatering because yeah. they, they, the homeowner's happy if it's lush and green, but you know, now there's more of an uh, effort to save on water. So um, getting the root system down deep is, is you know, the priority, and that can be done with overhead irrigation or with drip irrigation. And in general, if you can water infrequently but water for a longer period of time to drive the water down, the roots will chase the water deeper, you'll have better drop tolerance that way. Any other questions? Time for the quiz? Okay, so thank you very much for coming, and um, if you, are you supposed to be passing these out now? Or for okay, we have one landscape uh, certificate of completion for somebody that signed up for that. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you.